Right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've all had a good uh, lunch. And uh, now we're moving into our afternoon sessions. So the first of those sessions is a panel discussion, uh, how do SMEs defend their IP? Uh, and it's being chaired by Edmund Lobb, who's a UK and European patent attorney from Kilburn and Strode. Um, yeah, so this, this uh, discussion is about SMEs and how they defend their IP. So as a first off, can we have a show of hands of who is from an, an SME in the room? Okay, good. Fantastic. A and out of those, how many have applied for or have patents? About half, maybe a bit more. That's good. Um, so, uh, yeah, just briefly, I'm Ed Lobb. I'm a UK and European patent attorney from Kilburn and Strode, which is a large European firm. Um, we're, we're outside, we have a stand if you'd like to come and say hello, but this isn't about me. We've got three panellists here from SMEs. Um, we've got Jesse Lozano from PyTop, Steve Dan from Amplified Robot, and Anne McAleer from IDEX Biometrics. Now, I am going to shirk my duties to introduce them and let them introduce themselves. So, if you'd like to say a few words. Sure. Uh, I'm Jesse Lozano. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called PyTop. We make laptops and desktops that uh, put STEM-based education in schools. Um, I started the company three years ago with my co-founder in my living room, and uh, now we're getting up to 55, 60 employees um, with offices in UK, USA, and, and China, and we've got some a fair amount of patents now, so I guess that's why I'm here. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Steve Dan. I'm the founder of Amplified Robot. Amplified Robot uh, works in augmented reality and virtual reality space. Uh, and we work for lots of different companies like Vodafone and uh, McLaren and people like that. I also look after a couple of uh, companies uh, which we've actually sort of spun out of Amplified Robot. One of them called Medical Realities, which is using uh, virtual reality to teach uh, medical students how to become surgeons. And that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about today and about the patent implications. Hi, I'm Anne McAleer. I'm the IP manager at IDEX. Um, IDEX is essentially a fabulous semiconductor company. We design and develop fingerprint sensor technology and biometric algorithms. And we sell fingerprint sensors into three core markets, the, the mobile market, so for unlocking your, your phone, uh, into bank cards. Uh, so uh, a bit like Apple Pay, you put a biometric sensor on a bank card and use it for, for paying. And uh, also, obviously, a future market in the Internet of Things or anything you would like to put a fingerprint sensor on. Um, our unique selling point is that we have a flexible fingerprint sensor, which makes it particularly suitable for things like bank cards. I've been working with uh, MasterCard and also Idemia, which is uh, the new name for Oberter and uh, OT Morpho. Um, and we've been working with them on pilot trials of the biometric sensor and smart cards in South Africa uh, this year, and it's all going very well. So the next step is full steam ahead to commercialize the, the product. Um, we, I, I'm a one-person department. I am the IP department. Um, we've got about 220 patents and applications. We have a couple of trademarks. We've got lots and lots of trade secrets. Um, as for my own background, I'm an electronic engineer by training. Um, before I joined IDEX about two years ago, I was very briefly uh, working in Qualcomm. Uh, that was a, a, both a great thing and a terrible thing. Great because it was amazing to see inside one of the biggest technology chip companies and see how they manage patents and licensing and, and litigation. But terrible for me because I didn't really see how I was going to fit in there. So I much prefer working for a small, small company. So that was why I moved to IDEX. Before Qualcomm, Qualcomm bought Cambridge Silicon Radio, CSR. Uh, one of Britain's uh, semiconductor companies doing Bluetooth chips and I worked there as their patent manager for 10 years. When I joined we had about 100 or so patents and when we finally got bought by Qualcomm we had more than 2,400 patents and applications so I was involved in that over the years. Um, one of the things I did at CSR was to derive their um, processes internally for claiming on the UK patent box scheme. Um, before I got into patents I was a technology uh, product manager and I was also a technology consultant so I've worked in small companies, startups, and massive big corporations over the last while. Great, so we've got a really good range of uh, experiences and expertise here, and hopefully we'll be able to sort of get into some, 
some interesting points for the, for the SMEs here and for everyone else. So uh, we'll get straight on with it. Uh, again, please ignore the, the agenda because we've kind of thrown that out and come up with our own one. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll start off with uh, the beginning of the process. So I think that we're, you know, we're all pretty pro-patent on this panel, so um, especially me, otherwise I'm out of a job, you know. Um, <laughs> So I think that you know, even though you know, we've certainly advised clients not to proceed with patents in some cases, but generally we think patents are important. Um, to, to each of you, really, uh, how do you decide whether something is worth patenting? Uh, do you have any, any criteria for it? And, and, and how do you, what factors go into deciding whether or not something's worth getting a patent for? Anne, I'll start with you. Sure. <laughs> yeah, like you say, um, we are very much a, a pro patent company. Um, we make semiconductors, we sell into the smartphone market, and we sell into the banking industry. So why would we not be pro patent? It's an incredibly litigious sector, so we have to be pro patent. So right from the beginning, my CEO, the board, the investors are behind us having patents. So so that's a, that's a given. Um, so given that's the starting point, then it's um, we have various criteria. So we need to think beyond whether it's novel and innovative. We, we also need to really think about whether this is a technology that other companies are going to use. Um, that's the main point of, of patenting, really. So is it going to be used by the industry? Um, is it detectable? Um, how easy or difficult is it to design around? Um, the fit with the company strategy is essential. Um, sometimes, uh, being a small company, budget is a big thing that comes into play. Do we have the budget for this? If we do have the budget, sometimes it's useful to have a few wild cards you just throw in there just to see where they might head. Um, when I was in CSR, we were working in wireless, uh, wireless comms. So standards, technical standards was a big part of what we were doing. So uh, if you're involved in an industry where, where standards are involved, then you really need to think about standard essential patents. And that really comes down to what the standard is and what the IPR policy is of that standards body. So, CSR worked in Wi-Fi, and Wi-Fi you can have the stand a patent that's essential to the standard and downstream possibly get revenue from licensing. Um, whereas Bluetooth, which was the other thing CSR was, was really big in, uh, that particular standard has a zero uh, licensing fee structure. So you agree to license your patents to everyone who joins that Bluetooth special interest group, and you have no possibility of getting license fees for that. So why would you patent something in that standard? So Standards is a, is a big thing that comes into it as well, deciding whether you patent something or don't patent something. I think uh, from Amplified Robot's point of view, um, because we're actually creating uh, usually apps um, and software for um, other companies, um, we, we discuss with them about, about what, what, what they want to get out of it um, and about whether they need to have something patented. Uh, from a point of view of uh, something like we're creating with medical realities, I think it's very important uh, on a number of levels uh, that we uh, sort of get things uh, locked down as quickly as possible. Uh, not least to, because of medical realities, we're also raising money. Um, we're, we, we, we've had uh, angel funding and we're now looking for Series A funding. And having a patent or patents in place obviously helps in that process as well. So um, I'm, this is the sort of second or third patent that I've, uh, I've created for, uh, for my own companies. Um, but it's really horses for courses. Uh, mostly it's about exactly, you have to think long and hard about why you need the patent and also whether the patent's going to be useful, whether it's going to be defendable, and that can be not only defendable as it, is it your own original idea, but uh, do you have deep enough pockets to actually sort of keep it your idea? Uh, so there's lots of different things that come into the equation. Uh, yeah, I would, um, I mean, I, I'd agree with a lot of things you said, um, Stephen. Although I wouldn't say that, I, so I would say, I, I understand that patents have a very important place in, in the business environment. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm, I'm, I'm pro-patent in, there's a lot, especially in the tech industry, there's a lot of, it can cause a lot of barriers. Um, but uh, I, I've, uh, I, I think when it comes down to, in, in, in the beginning when, when, when we started what we did at PyTop, um, we didn't go down the patent route mainly because of the, well, it's costly um, to, it, it, in early startup days when you're in a living room, it's costly um, to do a patent and then it's, uh, and, and it's near impossible to defend it because um, lawyers cost money. Um, and, uh, and so it, I definitely think, you know, in the beginning, um, 
you, you kind of have to figure out what you, you know, if you want to patent something, then maybe you need to find investment like very early stage so that you can, you can go down that route properly. Um, now that we're a, a larger company with, um, so we're coming up to, we send out an awful lot of devices now, and we're in over 2,000 schools. Some of the stuff that we do, we've put a considerable amount of R&D um, efforts into, and so that's that's where we cross the line into, okay, well, we should start um, patenting some of these um, like extremely novel ideas um, that we've come up with. Uh, I guess the, the cool thing about a pie top is you can open it up and build stuff inside of it, and that mechanism um, is it, it's it's very difficult to create it the way we've done it, and um, and, it, and it was it was certainly something that um, that that we wanted to make sure that you know there was a lot of time uh, <laughs> that went into making it work the way that, that it does. Um, so I guess from a, from a, from somebody who is smaller and is now um, kind of bigger, um, at the start it was just impractical. Um, for, for a whole host of reasons. Um, now it's it's very much more practical and, and to a certain extent necessary um, in the in the in the kind of business environment that we inhabit. Great. So th uh, one thing that follows on from that that I was wondering is um, if you decide not to patent, how much would you open source your your technology, or how much would you keep keep secret and use trade secrets and things to to build value that way? I mean, I, sp I suppose I can talk to this because. Um, so we we didn't patent the 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 first the first uh, pie top that we that we made um, and we we you know kept things like data um, and, and power um, sort of specs open source so that people could build things so that they could put it in um, the laptop themselves. Uh, it, it really the the reason that we didn't um, I mean if you patent something and it's kind of out there then it's almost sort of showing a playbook of how to do um, what you're doing if you have no money to defend it then. Um, so yeah, it was it was you know keep it as open source as as, as sort of possible, but understand the the reason that you're, you're well a big reason you're not patenting is a is too expensive, but b you, you don't want to you know when you're especially small and you think you've got something really smart um, then then maybe don't um, because people probably won't probably won't look at what you've done until oh I mean unless it, we knew that we were going to be changing mm -hmm. the product um, in the future and so that was kind of the time when we knew we'd go down that route. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, you know, patent applications publish. That's the the exchange for the monopoly you get is that you tell everyone how it works. So if you don't want to do that, then perhaps yeah. don't patent in that. Well, case. or another opportunity, another possibility is to use the U.S. system where you patent with a, a request for non-publication. Um, the downside of that is you can only patent in the states, but it stays secret until it grants, and then only when it grants does it become public. So you end up with just a US patent, but you've, you've waited to see whether you can actually get the patent before it's in the public domain. Great, so, so moving on to once you've decided an idea is worth patenting. Um, you know, patents are obviously territorial, so a US patent doesn't get you any rights in the UK uh, and vice versa and applies around the world. Um, w we often advise clients to, to only file in key, key markets rather than everywhere they might be going, just as a, as, a, as a cost measure, really, because it can, the cost can, can rack up if you go everywhere. Um, Steve, one for you, I, I suppose. How do you decide where to apply and, and when? Yeah, I think that's very interesting for us because a lot of the stuff that we're doing, as I say, is uh, um, stuff work that we do on apps, um, and really apps are universal. So if we create, for instance, we're creating apps uh, for uh, initially work in this country, um, but they're actually going to ripple out around the world. Uh, so we need to think about how we're actually going to cover ourselves. Um, uh, in particular case that we have right now, uh, we're, we're actually going uh, in and getting uh, patents in uh, America first, because we see that's the sort of one of our key ma key markets. Um, and also, I think it's uh, whether to patent or not to patent. I think it's really from what we're doing, a, a lot of it is about round about code and code can be quite sort of difficult and contentious. Um, but if we see that we're actually creating something at uh, what I call crossroads, uh, which uh, is unique, um, that's the type of thing we actually want to, want to patent. Something that everybody at some point might like to use um, or, like, or might like to try and copy. So that's, that's really what we look to, to try and protect ourselves with. It's always a balance between, um, in, in actual fact, uh, uh, once you start on, 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 on the patent journey, it can get incredibly expensive. Um, and it, uh, it, it doesn't get cheaper, it gets more expensive as you go further down the line you go. Um, 
I can understand why, but uh, again, as Jesse said, when, when, when you're a startup company, that's a, a very big consideration about what you're going to patent and also how far you're going to take that patent and how far you're going to try and defend it. Yeah, I think that, that you make some interesting points. And, uh, and, and one further thing that kind of ties into that, that growing expense as thing goes on is, is how do you, do you have any mechanisms for controlling those costs um, in terms of perhaps maybe a patent looks like it's going to be difficult to get granted, you're having trouble with it, you know, when do you decide to, to cut your losses? Um, or when do you decide to, to throw more money at the problem, I suppose? Yes, I, I think it's something, obviously, the, 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 the key thing is, who, who do you sort of go to to help you with the patent? Um, we're working with Marks and Clerk at the moment. Um, we're very happy with, uh, with what they're doing. So I think it's crucial that uh, you create, as an SME, uh, for instance, it's important to actually uh, create a very good working relationship with your patent lawyers. Um, you need to be able to trust them and they need to be able to trust you as well. Um, so I think that's the first thing which is the, the, on our wish list of things. We actually uh, look at a number of uh, uh, companies before we actually sort of join up with one. Um, but that's the crucial thing as far as we're concerned. Do they understand what we're trying to do? Do they understand not only the, the small picture about the particular patent, but also the bigger picture about what we're trying to do as a, as a company, as a whole? Um, I think that's vitally important. It's good I to think hear. Oh, sorry, on, I was going to say on, on that point, I think it's really important to think big and to think global. Um, you might be a small startup company in Britain, but um, in my industry, for instance, if money was really, really tight and I had not enough money to file a patent, I would just file American patents. Yeah. Only in America, directly in America. Um, because that's where all the litigation is and that's where the patent market is. It's maturing elsewhere, things are changing. Um, American system's been a slightly, well, some might say disarray, maybe not quite as bad as that, but lots of things have happened in the States recently to change the way that the market's worked in, in the States. Mm -hmm. But there is no getting away with it still. That's, that's where litigation has happened in my sector, mostly. And it's where, where the money, where the financing and where the buying and selling of patents primarily happens. Um, it will change. Um, China seems to be bubbling up in the mix now. Germany's important, Britain's important, and it's different in different sectors. I speak from, from the electronic sector. But uh, if money is really, really tight, Amer American patents are worth more than any other country's patents, and that's just the way it is. Um, so I, I would definitely think about that if you're thinking about reducing costs. I think the other thing to think about, I, I totally agree with your point about um, getting really good advice from very good patent attorneys. Um, the patent attorney um, before that got a bit of a beat up, I'm afraid I would beat up some patent attorneys as well. There's a lot of variable uh, service out there and it's really important to get a good firm. You need really good quality drafting, you need to make every patent count when you're a small company and they're not all right, all the patent attorneys, and they're, they're not giving you good advice sometimes. Um, in the early days of CSR, we were this British small startup semiconductor company and like a lot of companies out there, we were filing in Britain first, waiting to the end of the priority year before we then filed a PCT application, waiting right to the end of the sort of 32 months before we filed uh, nationally in the US. And then we were taking maybe seven years to get a granted US patent it, for semiconductor industry. That was the wrong advice. That was not the right thing to do. We needed more American patents granted faster in order to deal with the fact that our technologies took off in that time. And we were selling what, you know, one of the biggest Bluetooth chip companies in that time, and we had hardly any American patents. So you need, you need really good advice. You need to think, think big right from the start. Yeah, I think you make some interesting points. And um, I should say there are some good patent attorneys out there. Um, there are, <laughs> you there know, are and, definitely. <laughs> and hopefully I don't get beaten up and secu security's on hand uh, if things take a turn. Um, but yeah, Stephen, good to hear that you've got a good relationship with yours as well, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's not all bad. Um, searching for patents and patent applications is an interesting one. It's something I advise kind of both ways on. Uh, th th there are two, two prongs to this, really. One is, is searching for patents that have disclosed similar things to what you're doing that might uh, uh, you know, be adverse to your chances of getting a patent application granted. And the other is patents that exist that are granted that you might be operating under the scope of and therefore infringing. Um, I've worked with clients that like to know, I've worked with clients that don't like to know. Um, and I'll, I'll put this one to you, well, which is most important to you and why? So I've got two perspectives on this based on the two, on 
you know, experience in two different kind of industry sectors and two different sizes of companies. So in, um, in CSR, uh, we did a transaction where we, uh, we bought an American company called Surf who were in litigation when we bought them. And as part of the, the, uh, the merger and acquisition, we acquired their head of, head of legal. So suddenly, instead of just being part of a legal department, I was reporting to this, a general counsel, the very, very American-centric uh, look on, on the world. And that general counsel, been, he'd been through many, many ter uh, turns of litigation in his, his past. And his policy through the, became the policy of the company, and the policy was no one in the company must look at a third-party patent. That's it. Nobody goes researching for third-party patents. And his, um, his way of thinking was, was because of discovery, the fear of discovery. So when you're in litigation, um, it's possibly triple damages if somebody sees that you knowingly infringed another person's patent. So that was one aspect of it. And the other aspect was we were working in this mobile comms industry, massive players, huge portfolios. How could we ever do a search and check whether we had freedom to operate? You know, we would never know for sure. So in his point of view, it was almost like a waste of time. Um, we had a big patent portfolio. The, the others were all going to have big patent portfolios. And it, it wasn't, the risk wasn't worth the reward in that particular situ situation. So no searching. Now, I'm in a small company, 140 people, fingerprint sensor technology still emerging. There's a small number of players. The portfolios are not very big. In fact, you see newsletters in the, in the biometrics industry and somebody will publish a newsletter saying, we just got five patents granted this week, yay! And you think, really? You're going to put that in a newsletter? Really? So it's a completely different dynamic, a completely different circle, uh, sort of cycle of the market. And there is value in us looking at patents and having an understanding of where our competitors are and what they're doing. So, um, so we do search uh, with care, though. The last thing I want to do is have one of the engineers who works sending me an email saying, oh, I've just had a look at fingerprint cards patents, and I think we're infringing this claim. You know, it, it's, it, we, we can't have that. We just can't have that. And we have to set realistic expectations about, I don't like the term freedom to operate, because I don't think you truly, how could you ever know that you have freedom to operate? So I'm searching, but I'm setting expectations to the CEO and to the board and to people around me that you know, we, we, we try, we look at useful keywords, we use good tools, we try and do repet you know, constant searching um, and we look out there, but we, we can't possibly know what we might see from, from another sector or like the gentleman from Cheers Interactive, you know, who would have thought that, that Apple would use a technology for welding that came from the Airbus? You, know, you, you, would, just, you would never have searched for that, would you? So, You've got, to, you've got to be realistic about what you can achieve with, with, uh, with searching um, and, uh, and, and use, it, use it wisely. So. Yes, I think from, uh, from, from our point of view, because we're relatively small compared to my dear colleagues up on the stage here, um, we tend to be sort of fast and agile and tend, uh, we, we, we wouldn't do uh, that much research up front uh, because we probably know the market that we're in uh, uh, probably better than most people. Um, so we tend to look at sort of patents with a in innovation, innovation patents, um, sort of uh, about an invention that we've come up with. Um, but also talking of Apple, um, it's always good to remember about design patents. Um, because uh, the, the look and feel of things, uh, there's a lot of things on the uh, initial um, iPhone uh, that they patented, which nobody thought that they'd ever be able to patent. That's just the uh, the shape of the tiles on the uh, on the screen, for instance. Um, that, that's why uh, nobody can have rounded tiles except Apple on the uh, smartphone screens. So it's important to think in both innovation terms and invention terms, but also in design terms as well. Uh, so although we're creating software, we also create apps which the, which the software runs on, uh, and we don't produce hardware per se, but we produce stuff that actually is displayed on other people's hardware. And it's that display which we also look to be able to patent as well. Um, I think what we're saying is it's horses for courses, isn't it? Yeah. And there's no one particular way which is right or wrong. I think you just have to feel your way through it. And again, I would say I, I lean very heavily on our attorneys. Yeah, um, I think for us, I mean, we, we, a lot of the uh, a lot of the things that we do have in it, they're inherently tied to our core feature product. Um, so there, there's 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 some initial 
they're saying like let's make sure we're not we're not sort of going to work on something that's just like straight up somebody's made this I mean it's really easy to find it um, but it, you know, there, there is no other laptop in the world that opens like ours um, it, it would be really easy for us to find it um, and um, and so yeah I, I think then then from the patents that we take out on on like the add-on boards that we were building well we're, we're relatively um, like you said like we have a really good understanding of the market and what's what's been made and the and and you know if we're, we're making it because it doesn't exist um, and so that's that's yeah I think it's really important for small companies who don't have legal departments you know like I said earlier I'm the, I am the IP department and I'm an engineer I don't have any legal qualifications and most of you are in that situation as well you don't have an in-house legal department so you've got to be careful about playing at being a lawyer um, if you read a patent you've got to look at the claims and you've got to interpret those claims and I'm not qualified as a patent attorney and Edmund is, but he's qualified as a British and a European patent attorney, if I'm correct. He's not an American patent attorney. So if he looks at an American patent's claims, he's going to interpret that with a, with a British and European goggles on, and he's not necessarily going to interpret the way that a US court would interpret it. So you've got to be so, so careful making assumptions, doing searches, and you know, there's wonderful tools like the guy from the Swiss Institute with the fantastic graphics. There's fabulous tools out there and many, many companies who will provide you that service, that patent landscaping service. But do be very, very careful about interpreting the results. I, I would, yeah, definitely. For that, I should come clean. I did law at university, uh, <laughs> and and it's like you know, people like <coughs> uh, when you do law at university, you realize how much you really should just go get a lawyer. Um, that's quite good. <laughs> um, I mean, there's no point at playing. Um, I thought it was just reading. It. Is it not yeah. just reading? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. um, but yeah, because because yeah, and, I mean, if you look at the whole like Waymo stuff, um, like Discovery, they take like everything, um, and it's like it can go against you if you think you if you've searched and you're like, oh well, maybe this is, maybe this is kind of the same. Like, well, forget about it. You've just you're, yeah, no, you know. So yeah, I, I don't play it being a lawyer. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's that, quite uh, difficult. I think you make a good point there, especially about sort of local advice. I mean, if I'm ever asked to do a, a an infringement opinion on a, on a U.S. patent, I you know I go to a U.S. attorney because they they know how to interpret the claims. And and anyone that's up to speed with the U.K. case law will know that interpreting U.K. claims now is uh, a minefield in itself. We've had a sea change in how that works. So. Um, certainly get good local advice, I think. Um, one thing that, that might be interesting to, to talk about as well is in terms of, you know, we've, we, we've discussed freedom to operate. I know, sorry, Anne, don't like that term, <laughs> but um, certainly some of the smaller clients I work with like to know if there's anything out there that will prejudice their, their, their patent application. So if there's something out there that's already published that's going to mean they can't get a patent, um, you know, we are obliged not to file claims that we know aren't novel basically so if something's out there we can't just file an application for it so in some some clients just like to not know that and and go on without that knowledge how much is that a concern for you uh, if at all uh, well probably uh, not so much a concern for me specifically uh, about what we do I think that the our, our companies are of a size and, and working in a certain area that, that we don't really require that um, as I say, it's the um, uh, one of the things which is probably I might be going slightly off topic just here is, is in, in actual fact we discussed about um, uh, where to file, um, and we, we, we've we, the sort of as, as a company that that we're creating things which can actually be used around the world instantaneously and distributed around the world virtually instantaneously. Um, and one of the, the the countries and one of the areas which is exercising my mind tremendously right now is China, for instance, um, because I'm, I'm totally unsure as to whether getting, uh, having patents and going to China actually mean anything right now. And that's one of the things I wonder if anybody else on the panels had that type of uh, thought or that type of problem. Uh, yeah, well, so <laughs> um, I, we run a... Um so we we run a, a, a twenty seven thousand square foot factory in China. Um, I think one of the main ways that we protect just our I you know our, our, our work in general is um, we are an incredibly like focused in house team. So we don't we don't ever use 
and third parties uh, in any technical sense. Um, part of that is we run our own PCBA, uh, Printed Circuit Board Assembly uh, line, which means that so the Gerber files that we create never leave the company. Um, it's really important, I would say. Um, I have seen um, other, I've seen other um, uh, co companies in my area uh, get their their you know not wholesale um, copied, but but you know very 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 similar things um, copied. And there's not there isn't a whole lot um, that you 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 could do. Um, I, I you know if it, if it was an American um, company um, that was that was that was copying your idea, or if it was um, a, a European company, it, it would be easier. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, right, because it's China and, and, and Asia, or a any country that's not the country that you're used to, to being in and, and traversing around is, is, is difficult to, um, it, 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 you know, it's complicated over here. It's, 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 uh, it's also complicated over there. Um, and so I would, I would say, you know, you gotta, like with, you know, like with anything, you want to do some like two-factor authentication and make sure you're not just trusting um, a third party uh, because uh, you know with something that's really really important to you. Um, it's not something. It, it's actually, I know a lot of especially it, we're because we have an ele a significant element of hardware in our company. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is to get somebody else to build your hardware for you, um, and that's really we've taken the exact opposite approach. And that um, the the way that our hardware works is really really unique, and it's, it's quite um, it's quite valuable f to us to keep that um, keep that in house and make sure we just know that there's no possible way um, that anyone else could just you know just get uh, you know get like an exact footprint of like well here's how you make all the PCBs which you, uh, and here's all of the little you know IC order numbers and everything that you use um, that would be uh, it, it would be it would be crazy <laughs> um, so yeah um, I, I would say difficult um, it, to, to protect yourself in China um, or other areas yeah to be I, I think you're right I think actually it's China but it's it's America yeah. you know, if you're a small company and you have a valuable technology big companies will try and rip it off that, that's what they do. That's, yeah, it's just the nature of the game. And, uh, and as far as I see, China is becoming increasingly sophisticated in, in uh, you know, Very changing um, the perception of, of um, you know, whether you can litigate there. You know, Qualcomm is litigating against a Chinese company in China and expecting to win. Um, so you know, it, it's, it's changing. It's really changing. I think that takes us quite nicely on to our, our next topic, which is about infringement. And if you have your patent granted, in a particular country and, and, and you find someone that might be infringing it, how often do you actually litigate that? And if you, if you don't litigate it, um, why not? Uh, and what else might you do? Uh, Jesse, I think you've got some interesting things. Uh, yeah, I mean, so as a, I guess, from a couple of points um, on this, I mean, as a smaller company and, and also as an, like an education-focused company, I think there's a lot of people out there that like to make, um, you know, Raspberry Pi uh, laptops and then call them pie tops. Um, they're, they're like people in their house and they're, you know, or, or they're like a 12 year old kid making a lunchbox and it's really cool. And actually, I, I like email them and I'm like, hey man, like awesome. You know, would you like a pie <coughs> top? Um, and, uh, but um, I guess there's, you know, there, there's the other side of it. Um, specifically, I mean, around trademarks. Um, and and kind of and that and that area where you know even a even a even a, a, a like a a, a completely non-contentious but like neutral okay we need to work out like who's got what trademark or what area can you apply this to and what area can we apply this to can be can be fairly expensive um, to to just go down that road where there's literally no bad feelings on either side but you still have to involve lawyers and then that, again that comes to the um, to the point of uh, at what point do you do you try and, and you know enforce this kind of stuff um, and it's really you know the answer is really when you've when you've got enough when you've got enough money to um, to, to to be able to, to go through the process because it will cost you know several tens of thousands of, of pounds just to do something that's not even particularly um, you know that, that's just like a straightforward ish legal um, thing so yeah I would uh, I, I, I guess. It, it sort of pick and choose your battles for sure. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, if it if it if it came down to it, and a really big company decided, and you really thought, okay, well, these guys are are totally 
um, you know, taking the mick on it, then uh, then yeah, obviously you've got to, and and that's just part of um, part of the business world, and you you probably have to hope that you have enough money to to, to keep up the the fight because they can go on for a very very long time, and that's normally what a big company would try and do is to stretch it out for as long as possible. Um, luckily, we haven't been in any situation like that, uh, and I hope never to be. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's probably, uh, well, yes, luckily we haven't had, uh, had, had to resort to anything like that, so um, long may that continue. <laughs> I don't want it to happen any time yeah. soon, that's for sure. Yeah. IDEX did assert a patent against another party, um, and, but it was part of a, a bigger action where the other, it was a joint development and one party um, allegedly made off with IP, and uh, so it was part of a, of a larger set of actions and it settled. Um, and I think that's more, most often what happens with small companies where you, know, you haven't really got a choice, you've, you've been forced into a situation where you, you have to do some action and if you have a patent then you know, that's the time to use it. I think the other, re the other occasion when you might have to get involved in litigation, if you're not necessarily going to be the real assertive you know, one who's going out there, um, you, you, you're trying to keep below the radar. But, um, Depends what kind of contracts you enter into. As, as a, you know, we're supplying semiconductors, and um, you know, are we warranting that we don't infringe other p people's patents? Are we saying that if the customer ends up being sued, because most likely, you know, when I was in CSR, that's what happened. It was CSR's customers of the Bluetooth chip that were being sued by another party, and we were obliged to assist them. Um, we didn't want to get involved in the litigation, but we were pulled into it because of the contracts we, we've entered with, with that company. So, so that's the other, the other thing. You, you might think you can avoid this. You might think you can, you can not play the game, but um, you, know, you get pulled into it. So you have to prepare best you can. Yes, I suppose also there's a, there's a very famous case in virtual reality in America um, where Facebook bought a company called Oculus Rift for $2.3 billion dollars and they didn't do the proper due diligence and uh, two of the people uh, from Oculus Rift uh, previously worked at another company uh, which in actual fact uh, sued uh, Facebook and won um, to the I think I think so far they've um, they've made about 725 million dollars out of it and they're looking to actually get a um, uh, money from every single Oculus Rift headset that's sold, so uh, it can be done. And you think that well, Facebook is one of those companies which is so big it's not worth uh, going after. But they they did. Um, they, they weren't totally a small company, but they certainly fought fought their corner. Mm -hmm. And I think also that shows a sort of uh, difficulty when uh, people move around from company to company, and the IP is up here. You know, a lot of the time, and sometimes they don't even realise um, when they're infringing something themselves because they will feel that they've originally come up with it at the at, at the first company, and uh, that it's down to them and uh, that n and nobody else. And um, perhaps they conveniently forget, or generally do forget, that uh, that company has actually sort of used that as a uh, uh, file file patents for that particular uh, type of uh, application and software. Um, and I think it can can happen uh, inadvertently, but also it can. I, I think in this particular case, it was probably more a case of um, Facebook not doing enough due diligence on the company that they were they were they were taking over, um, and not thinking about the ramifications. So that's another thing to think about if you're if you're merging with somebody or taking somebody over. Um, l look at what uh, what what they've got uh, hidden, the skeletons they've got hidden in their in their cupboards. Great. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left, I think. Um, so just like to open up to any questions from the audience. Oh, I, I, oh, OK, yes, sir. Go ahead. Mayor, um, I've got a quick comment, really, and unless Anne beats me up for it, I've got a question for you. <laughs> OK, thank you. It's um, Thomas Brock from Marks and Clark. Anne, uh, I'm actually quite grateful for what you said earlier about the searching. Um, because at the end of the day, y you can't be certain, and that's, that's quite difficult for people to see. I think it goes to the heart of what patents really are, and they're, ultimately they're a business tool, nothing else. Um, the searching exercise really is one that allows you to, at best, allows you to assess risk for your company in a, in a given situation and to get to a point, if you're lucky, 
um, where you can decide, well, actually, that's a risk worth taking, that's a risk we're comfortable with. Purely commercial. Mm -hmm. um, I think that go also goes to what, what the, the last panel sort of almost criticized in patent attorneys, that, that such a commercial aspect uh, is missing. It's, it's refreshing to see that. Thank you very much. Don't beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not beating you up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> not unless you give, give me a big invoice, then I might beat you up. Uh, not, not for this, not for this. <laughs> uh, Jesse, um, now, I, I'm quite fascinated and I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of cognizant of the fact that maybe I need um, to be educated about your product a little bit more. So forgive me if I, if I miss the mark here. The, I've, I've got a question. So, so you've got a modular laptop and, yeah. and I can see th um, that, that what you're doing there is, is, is quite unique and you want to protect it and, and, and so you should. Is there not uh, the flip side to this whole thing where you say, well, actually, if people can plug into our core modules, then, 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 then our, our product, the offering is actually a lot more attractive and I might grow my market. Could you comment on that a little bit, maybe? Yeah, um, sure. I mean, th that's why the data um, and power uh, uh, specs for the for the laptop are, are open source. So, is, is uh, uh, effectively um, when when someone so the Raspberry Pi has these little things called general purpose input output pins, and you can control things with um, by turning them high and low. Uh, and and what we do is port those over to the module the modular rail in the laptop. So. The, the things that are you know open source about our, our computer are the things that would allow people to create their own add-on boards or, or create uh, you know we each laptop has something called an inventor's kit in it which has like all these LEDs and you know sensors and whatnot and you you create projects by plugging them into the laptop and adding code to them um, so that part is all very available um, and and is beneficial because people make some just amazing um, Things, uh, things that I, I never would have um, expected people to do with it, um, and so that that, that bit is, is very cool. But m more s on the you know, the you know what do we protect um, side of things? Well, you know things like um, you know how we cool the device. Um, it's very novel. Um, the, the 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 keyboard can travel f five inches um, and still work, uh, which is, is kind of very difficult um, to achieve mechanism and the way that. Um, the way that certain elements sort of position um, themselves in the in the device, so that those are the more like okay, well these are things that we've we've spent considerable time, effort and uh, engineering, uh, you know, on. Um, that's those are the things that are that are that are protected. Yeah. So, so you're protecting the core of, of of what's happening, and then leave others to build a universe around it if there's a want. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and we, it's really, I guess, the crux of what we do is we provide people with a with a really fantastic platform. Well, I call it like low floors and high ceilings. It's very um, easy to get in, um, and then you can you can really go um, very advanced with it and create. I mean, people, I've seen people make like like. Put low ran modules into them, um, turn it into uh, like create their own pollution weather sensors, um, do a whole bunch of cool stuff with it. But yeah, the there was a considerable amount of effort to create the plat to make the platform as easy um, as it is to get into it. Um, and part you know a big part of that is the actually the mechanical side of of what we do. Um, it, it it's it's a it's a laptop like no other. Um, so if you, you you'll you'll see what I mean if you just go to the website. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So I have one myself, and it, it builds on uh, something that uh, Jan mentioned in his opening address, actually, which was about reasons why SMEs perhaps don't patent, um, being you know the cost uh, levels of understanding, and I agree to a large extent with what was said in the last panel about how the industry and that's the patent offices and patent attorneys need to engage more and, uh, and explain the process and its benefits to to people that don't have that that understanding already um, one stat that I've seen uh, in a very reputable industry journal was that only 0.3 percent of SMEs have international patents um, do you agree with those sort of reasons why uh, and what do you think us or you could be doing <laughs> to to improve that I think it is a, a, a knowledge thing and I think in the, one of the panels this morning you were talking about the the um, lack of good advice I think that that is really really key and I think um, it is very difficult in a small company to see why you invest this money up front um, but I think someone said earlier as well that patents give you control. I'm not sure as a small company patents give you control, but they give you options. 
And if, if you've got those options, you've got possibly an option to think about licensing. You've got an option if you end up in a sticky situation with a, a partner or a supplier or a competitor where you've got something to negotiate with. Um, you've got possibly a licensing revenue stream down, downstream. That there's, there's lots of possibilities that happen if you've got patents. And you can't, you don't know what you don't know, but um, patents have a life that's beyond your company. Um, somebody quoted statistics earlier about how many small companies fail. But um, I said before I was a product manager, so I worked for a 3G technology startup called Ubinetics that uh, worked in test products for 3G. And we were patenting in 3G right then, that was about 2005. And we weren't patenting essential standard patents, we weren't going to standards bodies, but we were patenting around how you implement 3G. So that was in 2005. Ubinetics got bought by CSR. CSR acquired those patents as part of that, that deal. Now CSR for a little while thought about getting into 3G chips, but it didn't really happen, so they didn't bother. But they kept the patents because they thought, well, there's some patents here in 3G and we work a lot in the mobile space, so they might just come in handy for litigation. And we thought about selling them and we thought about abandoning them, and, but we just kept them. Anyway, CSR gets bought by Qualcomm. Qualcomm now own those patents from Ubinetics from 2005. We would never have imagined that Qualcomm would end up with those patents. Now Qualcomm obviously have a vast, vast, vast portfolio of patents. But right now they're in big trouble because they're being threatened for their, whether they're um, having unfair licensing practices and they're being, being pursued at all sides from a regulatory situation and even by, by Apple. And one of the arguments Qualcomm is making is that uh, they don't deserve this because not only do they have a huge patent portfolio of, of standard essential patents in 3G, 4G, 5G, but they also have a huge portfolio of patents around those standards about how you implement 3G, 4G, 5G. So are those patents that we created in 2005 from Ubinetics valuable to Qualcomm? Right now, yes, they are. You know, the context is completely different, but those patents have a value right now. And we could never have foreseen that back in 2005. So again, it's like I said, you've got to think way beyond where you think things will end up. It's uh, interesting to see where patents go. Yeah, I think from a, a, a point of view of uh, sm small companies, I, I, I think that I spend a lot of time in America, and uh, basically the, 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 they're very pro-patents. Um, and I think that's probably rubbed off on me um, because I can see the advantage of it. I think as, as, as a sort of, whether we can call this an industry, or a, that, that I think that more needs to be sort of said to small companies, to growing companies, to companies that start up, um, because I think a lot of the time it's just not on their radar. And I think that's, uh, I, 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 I think that's wrong. I think that uh, um, if anybody asks me, um, I, I host a number of uh, sort of meetups to, to help um, other um, SMEs um, in, uh, in, in our particular areas as, and with uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and also now artificial intelligence. And that's one of the things that we always try and get over. Um, I also um, am the co-president of the VR and AR Association, which is a worldwide association, originally started in, in America. And again, they're, they're very pro on getting companies with inside that association to understand how they can protect themselves, protect their ideas, and protect their future. Um, because as, as Anne says, you, you never know when what, what you've <coughs> got and what, what you've bought. And I mean, there are a number of companies just recently that have been bought purely for the patents mm -hmm. and nothing else. Um, so I think that's, uh, that, 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 that's something that m more should be made of. Um, and I, I think especially with uh, small and med medium startups, then I think that uh, they need to be educated a lot better than that they are right now into how, how patents are, are good rather than bad. Yeah. I, I would, yeah, I mean, and I can, I can really, I mean, I can talk from the, the side of, you know, patents are, 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 are bad, uh, are a bad thing, because, I mean, I can, and I can understand the, the argument for it. Um, it, it. There's a, you know, a big and growing kind of open source movement, but I've also seen, um, in, even in my, you know, three years of doing PyTop, some of the, like, big open source, uh, I, I would say, people that I, I really uh, admired, you know um, that no longer do what they do because the you know there are there are now really big um, companies that 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 do it instead um, and 
and uh, and so they they don't get to do the thing that they you know might have pioneered like even ten years ago um, from a from a open source thing. Um, and so yeah, I think you know it, it it is like the gentleman said it's a business tool and it's something that's definitely a reality of the of the day to day. Speaking from you know startup world, um, patents can uh, can really help you um, push. Your like your you know your ability to fulfill on the vision that you're trying to to, to do in the world, it, 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 because they help um, when you're you know when you're seeking investment or you're trying to show that you know you can have you've got the traction and you've got everything and then you've also got um, patents to, that that help back up your idea and show how it's defensible because it's quite often a question that people get is well, how defensible is the product that you're making? Could somebody just come in here? Copy your thing and you know put like fifty million dollars behind it and then be the thing. Um, well, when you've got you know there's there's a, a whole way a host of things that you need to say or to to become defensible. Like, do you have a great and engaged community? Um, do you have a team of like industry experts that are actually just as good as anybody that you might find at like Google or Apple? And and then the third, um, although less important than community, um, really, and the tape technical talent on your team is well do you do, do you have pat do you have any patents or do you have any any um, legal defensibility to the product that you've made and normally that speaks to the technical talent of your team and, and, and that side of things um, so yeah um, uh, in terms of in terms of like why why um, get them from a from a small from from you know a, a, a relatively new team uh, you know it can really help in the in the uh, how your business is perceived, um, and it really is just a it's a it's a business necessity when you're inventing things, um, and, and like like them or not, um, uh, until until we get some big rule changes or something like that, which I don't even know would be, you know, when you really look into it, they they serve a purpose and they serve a purpose for a reason because a lot of I could tell you from experience now we've put a lot of time and effort into developing the things that we've we've patented, and I think. You know, I try and we try and be fair with it, um, and the, and 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 if you know if it if that system didn't exist, then it would be, you know, it would be very difficult to justify the the time and effort spent on building the thing that you're building, um, because somebody else could could really just come in and 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 and, and sna uh, snag it. So yeah, um, there's a few reasons, but yeah, that's that's what I would say on that. I think one comment I'd like to make, but on the education side of things, is that I understand that in Germany, manufacturers or, or engineers are, uh, are trained in IP, the relevance of IP as their training. As an engineering student, uh, you know, originally, I certainly didn't know anything about IP when I graduated. Some would say I still don't. But, um, <laughs> You know that that's evidenced by the stats we saw earlier on of the filings that are happening in Germany, massively outweighing those that are made in the UK. And and I think educating at, at that early stage, before someone's even considering coming up with anything, um, could be very useful. And where that responsibility lies, I don't quite know. But yeah. um, I was at a Cambridge Wireless event a few weeks ago, and it was all about um, 5G and edge networks of the edge. And there was a Huawei and Interdigital there on the platform, along with three startup British companies. And the three startups were fantastic. You know, they had amazing technology. And one of them was doing a demo, and Interdigital did a demo, and Interdigital's demo failed. But the other startup companies worked fantastically. It was so impressive. And I asked the question to the panel, um, and I said to the startups in particular, you know, are you patenting your technology? And all of them said, no, we're not. It's too expensive, and we don't see the value, and we don't understand why we should patent. And they're sitting next to Interdigital and Huawei. Huawei now one of the biggest filers in, um, of American patents, actually, now. And um, I think it's, I think it's a bit naive, and and, and I, I worry you know, if, if if that's you know, British industry, if that is the attitude. Um, we are a bit self-selective, perhaps in this audience. You come to a patent conference, you're probably interested in patents, but I'm not sure that is the the general view. And uh, I think it, it's a shame. Well, I think it gets a really bad rap because um, a lot of, especially you know, America's can be quite litigious and. Um, like I've, there are a few great documentaries on people who literally go to America to, to they're like, okay, this guy owns like 5,000 patents. Um, they go to a business park in the middle of nowhere, and it's and it's just a, it's a it's one of these it's a business that just buys patents on the cheap from bankrupt companies and then tries you know goes from the bottom up and tries to um, get get money out of and that's really tarnished a lot of the yeah. 
the industry, I think. And it's very, you know, it's very different from what a real patent, you know, and real, you know, protecting of patents is. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been dealt a bad name. Mm -hmm. a yeah, we've got a couple of minutes, maybe. Uh, just, just a brief comment. I think, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm German, I'm a German patent attorney, I've got insight into the German system, and I'd, I'd like, actually, from that position, I'd like to uh, speak for, for the UK industry, actually. The reason, one of the reasons why there are so many patent filings in Germany it's very simply that they've got an act that requires an employer to file a patent application as soon as the employee's made an invention or to give that invention up. Mm -hmm. It's automatic. Um, that breeds a certain behavior and it doesn't include, in all cases anyway, knowledge of what to do with a bloody thing once it's filed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so it's, it's quite easy to say, well actually there's this, I, I say this as a German, it's quite easy to say, well there's this country and they file so many patents, oh isn't that wonderful? Um, and then actually make it commercially relevant. Mm -hmm. it, that, that does not follow. Um, I, think, I think it's true that, that a, a little bit of more understanding in the UK of, of the value of a patent would do, would do some good. But the, I don't think the differences between the two countries at least are as stark as, as the numbers would suggest, not by any shot. Okay, thanks, that's interesting. Um, I think we're out of time, so it just leaves me to, to thank the panel, and thanks for listening. <laughs>